I am Ron Berkey, and I did found the Virtual Agency Project. One evening in April of 2003, while watching the movie Apollo 13, I was struck by the idea of sharing what I thought of as the Apollo experience. Uh, to me, that meant running the original Apollo flight computer software on personal computers. Uh, preserving the software didn't occur to me because I imagined finding it already online. But I was mostly wrong about that. Nowadays, preserving the software for the various onboard computers of the Apollo and Gemini missions from the 1960s and 70s is a big deal for me. Today, I'll concentrate on the Apollo Guidance Computer, or AGC. One was installed in the Apollo Command Module and another in the Lunar Module, or as it was originally called, the LEM. Later on, I'll have a few remarks about the Saturn V's computer as well. The AGC was developed by MIT's Instrumentation Laboratory, today known as Draper Labs, and manufactured by the Raytheon Corporation. Because of time, I'll have to ignore the many interesting details of the AGC and its software, so I'll talk almost entirely about preservation of the software. But given that there were 20 Apollo missions, more or less, with separate software for the LAM versus the command module, that's still a lot of software preservation to discuss. Here on the left, we see the interior of an AGC. On the right, we see the astronauts interface to the AGC, the display keyboard or DISCI. By modern standards, the AGC had a pretty novel design. It was very slow and had a very small memory. On the other hand, the real-time multitasking fault-tolerant executive software was quite sophisticated given the limited hardware resources available. In fact, nearly 2,300 AGC software versions have been identified. We're looking at their evolutionary tree. As far as I know, the development began with software called Eclipse in 1963. Eventually, command modules were loaded with software having names like Corona, Sunspot, Solarium, SunDisk, Colossus, Comanche, Artemis, Skylark. LEMS, meanwhile, had Sunburst, Sundance, or Luminary. And there were ground test versions such as Sundial and Aurora and engineering versions like Shepaton, Zerlina, and Diana. In my opinion, software preservation is about more than archiving source code. It's about the documentation needed to understand the design, use, and evolution of the software. It's about having access to software development tools yourself, which in this case means being able to assemble the source code into an executable. It's about being able to run the executable and to do so in the intended context, which in this case means to fly simulated but otherwise authentic Apollo missions. How do you get the source material in the first place? In a word, bag and you have to know who to beg and how to beg. But at the moment, I'd prefer to talk about what happens after we have the source materials in hand. Understand first that nobody ever hands us machine readable source code. We have to come up with that ourselves. Depending on the situation, so far we've used three different methods to do that. Let's start with the most common scenario. It starts by getting access to a hard copy of a so-called assembly listing. That's a printout made by the Apollo developers when they assembled the source code 50 or 60 years ago. It's usually a stack of 11 inch by 14 inch fan fold paper a couple of inches thick. About 1500 pages are devoted to the source code and about 150 pages are a so-called octal listing of the executable produced by the assembler. How does the hard copy turn into a scan? You can use a commercial service if you can afford it and if you can trust the service to handle an irreplaceable historical printout. Or you can use a digital camera. I like hanging the printout vertically and triggering the camera by remote control, but know how to properly configure the camera's white balance settings, which unfortunately I did not. Nowadays, a book scanner may be better, but there's a trick involved because the best path for the fan fold paper is under the scanner, which normally would be sitting directly on the table. I use a homemade platform that leaves a gap between the scanner and the table. Also, a frame or registration marks may be useful for software that post-processes the images after you've scanned them. Although these days, with the right setup, your smartphone's camera may be even better than a book scanner in some ways. Do we use optical character recognition software to turn the scans into machine-readable source code files? No, we do not. My slogan, OCR is no CR. 
why? Well, OCR works best when you start with hard copy having very good print quality. The printouts we work with seldom have that. Perhaps the worst thing is that modern OCR software seems to rely heavily on dictionaries specific to the languages being recognized. It's like autocorrect on your phone, and you know how well that works. Imagine how well it would work if your autocorrection dictionary was for the wrong language. Instead, a team of volunteers manually transcribes the source code and separately transcribes the octo listing of the executable. We then process the transcribed source code using our modern assembler and compare the executable produced by the assembler to the transcribed octo listing. If there are mismatches, we correct the transcription. And we just keep doing that until the executable is perfect. Here's a summary of that entire process. Notice that syntax highlighting for source code is a very convenient byproduct. This, this process ensures that instructions are transcribed correctly. But what about program comments, which are discarded by the assembler and thus not cross-checked by the assembly process? Typos in program comments may seem benign, but we'd still like some kind of extra proofing magic to eliminate them. I've already claimed that OCR isn't too useful for extracting source code from a scan, but it's not entirely worthless for proofing. By combining a scan, an OCR of the scan, and a transcription of the scan, there's a way to overlay a colorized version of the transcription directly atop the black text of the scanned images. Wherever the text remains mostly black, it's almost certainly correct. But wherever there's noticeable color, there may be a transcription error. In other words, you just double check stuff that's in color. By the way, up close, the colors visually pop out more than it may seem in these slides. The best example here is the whiff at lower right. It was probably incorrectly transcribed as WTIH. Another thing, when there's transcribed code for multiple similar versions of the software, there are tools for comparing two or more versions side by side. Of course, differences may be valid version-related changes, but they may also be transcription errors. Two independent software transcriptions aren't likely to have transcription errors in identical locations. Yet another sometimes difficult to detect problem is when a symbol is misspelled consistently throughout an entire transcription. Our stereotypical problem is the symbol POO and its friends. Is it P-O-O-H or is it P-0-0-H? Comparing the sorted symbol table from the original assembly listing versus the one output by our modern assembler is a powerful way to find such misspelled symbols, if the layouts of the tables and the sorting orders of the symbols are the same, which can be a very tricky problem. Now recall that I said we have three very different methods of acquiring AGC source code. That's all I have to say about the first method, so let's move on to the second. Suppose you don't have an Apollo era printout to work with. Sometimes museums or collectors own physical AGC rope memory modules. These are cartridges of read-only memory, up to six of them per AGC that hold the executable software. Sometimes those owners can be persuaded to give us access to them. We're able to dump the contents of the modules, creating an octo listing of the executable. These modules have built-in parity bits and checksums for extra confidence that dumps are valid. We can disassemble such a dumped octo listing to get rough, imperfect source code for that AGC software version. Finally, the imperfect source code often can be perfected by comparing it to similar software versions and importing chunks of source code from those similar versions. But what if there's neither a printout nor a physical memory module? Under the rare conditions listed in this slide, an AGC software version can sometimes be reconstructed anyway. First, you clone the source code for the software version that you think is closest to the one you want to reconstruct. Then one by one, you edit in each of the software changes that are described in the Apollo era paper trail. Mostly that means pasting code from a similar AGC version in which you know that the same change had also been made. Having done all that, you assemble the source code. If the checksums are as hoped for, success. For example, the Apollo 10 command module software and the Apollo 14 LEM software were reconstructed in exactly this way. As a final check, you fly the mission in a space flight simulator. Speaking of which, our CPU emulator and our collected AGC software have been integrated into the Orbiter space flight simulation system with the NASP add-on 
That's N-A-S-S-P. So in Orbiter, Apollo missions use a fully operational AGC. We're looking at a simulated Apollo 15 lunar landing at Hadley Rill. The landing is just under 14 minutes total, but we're only going to see a bit from the middle as the LEM swoops down over the lunar Apennine Mountains. For this mission, the LEMS AGC runs software known as Luminary 210, and specifically it's using the sub-programs called P63, P64, and P66. At the moment, P63, landing maneuver braking phase, is running. Incidentally, the simulation does have a human pilot, Nick, but it so happens that the AGC can handle this lunar landing automatically, so Nick is basically just observing the action the same way we are and occasionally checking the disky at the bottom of the control panel. The P-63 program is now nearing its end, after which it will automatically transition to program P-64, landing maneuver approach phase, at which point the LEM will pitch over, but I'm going to end the simulation when that happens, so we'll miss the rest of the landing. And there's pitch over. A couple of decades has made a big difference in the amount of publicly available Apollo flight software and related material. Two AGC software versions have turned into over 30, representing the full AGC software needed for 10 different Apollo missions. And a couple more missions seem to be on the way as I speak. Uh, meanwhile, a mere handful of documents has turned into nearly 3,000. But the wish list does still contain some very significant items. Now, that's all I have to, about the AGC today, but I do have some time left over. So let me tell you a story about the Launch Vehicle Digital Computer, or LVDC. This is yet another Apollo flight computer covered by our project, but different from the AGC. The story will illustrate a few of the kinds of preservation-related frustrations we experience. Realize that the AGC itself couldn't control the actions of the Saturn V rocket, mostly. That job was performed by the LVDC, developed and manufactured by IBM's Federal Services Division. At some point, we got word that the U.S. Space and Rocket Center archive had a copy of this software. But the archive told me that they couldn't legally allow me to digitize the program listing. If I wanted it, they said, I'd have to copy it by hand, which sounded pretty unpleasant. But eventually, I decided to do it anyway. So on my vacation, I drove 750 miles from Dallas, Texas to Huntsville, Alabama, only to find once I got there that it was a mix-up by the archive. In fact, they had no LVDC software at all. Since I happened to be there anyway, I talked to some of the museum's docents who were Saturn V old timers. One of those was an IBM Federal Services Division Manager for LVDC software development. He told me some things. Nobody could possibly have a copy of the code, he said, because it was classified. You didn't just take classified material home with you. Also, he insisted the source code was destroyed after each mission. And finally, he said my project was completely worthless because the LVDC could never be run as a simulation anyway, without, without simulating certain of its peripheral devices too, something he imagined was impossible. I know now that these claims were mostly false, because a few days before the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, one of the original LVDC developers unexpectedly appeared and gave me a printout of an LVDC assembly listing. Admittedly, this was a buggy engineering version of the code for an alternative mission profile that never flew. But nevertheless, it's a big fat printout of real LVDC source code. And no, it's not marked as being classified. But I've not posted the source code online and I won't give you a copy of it unless you can prove to me that you're legally what's known as a US person. Why? You see, in theory, a Saturn V could be used as a launch vehicle to deliver a warhead if you had a billion dollars to build the rocket and a launch facility that could handle it. Under that theory, export of the software may be prohibited due to US regulations known as the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR. I've had attorneys specializing in space law looking at the question of whether or not ITAR actually applies to LVDC source code or not. They've been looking at it for three years. Finally, here are a few takeaways, platitudes really from my experiences with the virtual AGC project. If I had to choose just one, I think I'd pick number three, more software from the past may be recoverable than you think. But never forget that software recovery may also be dependent on the extra material you collect 
even if it may not itself be software or may at first seem irrelevant. Uh, so I may be the odd man out today because the talks before were all sort of gave you the view of the forest and not of the trees. And today I've given you view not only the trees, but maybe the leaves. So thank you for your attention. Again, I'm Ron Berkey of the Virtual AGC Project, and that's all I have prepared for you today.